56, his PhD. One year later, in 1957, he joined Robert Hofstra's group at the High Energy Physics Laboratory at Stanford University. In 1960, he was hired as a faculty member in the physics department of MIT. In 1963, he collaborated with other physicists from the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and worked with them for several years. And between 1968 and 1969, he conducted experiments with Henry W. Kendall and Richard E. Taylor, which gave the first experimental evidence that protons had internal structure. For this later on, they shared the 1990 Nobel Prize in Physics. In 1980, he became director of the Laboratory for Nuclear Science at MIT and served as head of the physics department. And over the years, he has served on a number of program and scientific policy advisory committees. He's been a member of the board of the University Research Association and member of the High Energy Advisory Panel for the Department of Energy. I'm happy to say that in 2003, he signed the Humanist Manifesto, which echoes several themes, among one of them which says, life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of humane ideals. He is currently member of the Board of Sponsors of the Bulletin of the Auto Atomic Scientist. He is an institute professor at MIT, an honorary professor at the University of Belgrade, Serbia, and a professor of statistics at Stanford University. But he's just not a man, he's not only a man of science, he also enjoys theater, painting, and studying Asian ceramics. Sir, where do you find the time? Please help me welcome this man who has so many significant achievements to his credit and has decided to come over and hopefully help us find our path to discovery, Professor Jerome Isaac Friedman. do is sort of describe what, how I sort of got my path into physics and into some general research programs. And perhaps you can take away some of the lessons that I learned, which may be helpful to you. First of all, um, I grew up in Chicago during the Great Depression. My parents were very poor. Uh, my father could barely make a living. But nevertheless, they were able to leave a reasonable life. I, as a young child, I uh, enjoyed painting and drawing, and I spent many hours a day doing that when I went at school. And my parents encouraged me to do that. My parents um, were immigrants. Uh, they had no formal education. They had the point of view that the only way we could make it in, in, in America was that if the children got an education. And they did everything in their power to make sure that we got an education. So when I decided to go into high school, I went into a special high school, which had an art program. And I enjoyed painting and I had, to, in fact, the art program allowed me to paint and draw about three hours a day. As a consequence of that, I didn't take many uh, subjects in mathematics. I had one course in physics. I had perhaps a course in algebra and solid geometry. And my course in physics was so bad that the only thing I remember from it was that the teacher burned his sleep on a Bunsen burner. <laughs> and that was the only thing given that entire semester. And so I was on my way to uh, becoming a painter. I had basically entered a number of uh, national contests. I won a 
few natural prizes for my work, and I was happily on my way. And during, uh, during my summer of my third year, uh, after my third year of high school, I visited a very nice museum in Chicago called the Museum of Science and Industry. And I enjoyed all the exhibits. I just wanted to see what was going on there. I passed through the bookstore, and I picked up a book written by Albert Einstein. Uh, and the uh, subject was uh, relativity, of course. But the idea there was that if you had only algebra, you could at least understand special relativity. And that intrigued me, because I had heard about all the strange effects in, in spectral relativity, you know, the idea that a moving clock, a clock that's moving very rapidly, it shows time at a slower rate. A meter stick that is moving very rapidly shrinks. And I said, my God, this is, this is really interesting stuff. I really, really like to understand it. So I took this book and I spent the entire summer going through it, equation by equation. I finally derived all the equations there, the, the so-called Lorentz transformations to show you how time changes, and how uh, the stick shrink and all of that. But at the very end of it, I said, you know, this is really neat stuff, but I still don't understand it. And the reason I didn't understand it was a very deep reason. And that is the fact that light basically, light basically has the same speed in all inertial frames. And what I mean by that is the following. For example, if a train is coming toward me and somebody throws a stone toward me from the train, the stone actually acquires the velocity of the train and therefore I see a, the stone flying somewhere faster. <coughs> on the other hand, if somebody turned on a flashlight and I measured the speed of light uh, from this moving train, it is just the speed of light. It is just the speed I would have I would have measured had the train not been moving. That intrigued me and surprised me, and I could not understand it. And I decided this is something that must be very deep and I would like to try to understand it. So I decided actually, when I, when I graduated, I would go to the university and ultimately uh, study physics. And uh, when I graduated from high school, I did get a scholarship to the Museum School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, which I didn't accept, and my art teacher was very angry about this. But I decided I'd have to do what I felt I wanted to do in terms of my own personal development. Uh, so I, I went through a special program uh, studying general subject liberal arts for two years, and then in 1950 I entered the physics department. And it was extremely competitive, and it was extremely hard. And there were times I said to myself, did I do the right thing? Had I made the right choice? And I just really wasn't certain about it. But the one thing which kept me going was the fact that I loved the subject. I really enjoyed what I was studying. You know, when I entered uh, the University of Chicago, I didn't even know what a sine or a cosine was. I never took trigonometry in high school. And I had to learn all these things. And I had to learn them rapidly because you know, physics basically is based on mathematics. It's the language of physics. But I had to learn that very rapidly, and the physics courses were hard, and I struggled. So I said to myself, I really love this subject so much. The university is going to have to flunk me out. I will not drop out. And I continued, and I slowly caught up, and I was able to carry out the work of the rest of the class. And I was able to pass the examinations, which are given to, uh, for example, there's one examination given uh, after, two, after, after a year and a half, and then another examination given after another year and a half. And uh, I passed both these examinations, and I was ready for my, for my research work. And the University of Chicago had a fantastic faculty, made up some of the greatest people in the world. The reason for it was that Enrico Fermi uh, was teaching there, and he was the intellectual leader of the department. He had some kind of stuff with this incredible faculty. But when I decided that I was going to go and find a research supervisor, I said to myself, 
why not go after the very best? I'm going to go ask Enrico Fermi if I could work for him. If he says no to me, it's not a disgrace. This is, this is, the, this is one of the greatest physics of the 20th century. Uh, if he says yes to me, it would be a fantastic thing for me. So I went to ask uh, Fermi, and to my great surprise, he said yes immediately. He didn't ask me how he did in my coursework. He didn't ask me how I did in the examination. He said, sure, come and work for me. And I was so delighted. It was almost as if I had won the lottery. It was just an incredible thing. And I, I saw physics being carried out at its very best. And I had this wonderful experience of seeing this man who was an absolute genius do his, do his work. And unfortunately, during the, my thesis project, he died suddenly from a very rapidly developing cancer. And I was stranded. I, but I decided not to give up. Because what happened was that I went to see various professors. They said, sure, you could come and work for me, but I want you to do another problem. I want you to do a problem that I would like you to I'm interested. And I already had spent two years working on the problem that Fermi had assigned me. So that didn't work out too well for me. Finally, a very kind professor saved me. He said to me, he said, Jerry, finish this project, do a good job, and I will sign your thesis. And I did it. And I, he signed my thesis, and he really saved me. I got a degree. And I worked, I worked at, at Chicago for a year trying to get uh, a job, and that was also a problem because there wasn't anybody who really would sponsor me for a job. So I, I was there for a year. And that year, I joined the efforts of another professor there, Valentine Delegate, to do an experiment which everybody said was a waste of time. He could get nobody else to work with him. And I said to myself, this is such an important question. Maybe the probability that it's successful is small. But it's so important, it's worth the effort. And what it was, it was to test the conservation of parity uh, in the weak interactions. And what that means is that in the conservation of parity, what it, what it really means is that if you change x to minus x and y to minus y and z to minus z, that the, the laws of physics and the results of physics should not change. Makes a lot of sense, right? However, there were indications which suggest that maybe this wasn't true. We can react it, and it should be tested. So it turned out that uh, I, I, jo I joined this professor, and we, it, we ended up being one of the first three experiments which demonstrated the non conservation of parity in the weak interactions, which uh, was a tremendous surprise to the community. It, it, it's another way of looking at it is that if you, if you have a process occurring, and you look at it in a mirror, if we don't have the conservation of parity, the process in the mirror is different. It doesn't have the same answer. And, and this was really shocking. It, it, but it demonstrated something to me that was very important. And that is, in science, if you're not willing to take a risk, you will never, ever do anything important. And this worked, and this was very important to me later. Because after I, 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 I finally got a job, I worked for Robert Hofstadter at the uh, Stanford, at the Stanford High Energy Physics Lab. I learned, the, I learned the technique of electron scattering. And then uh, Henry Kendall and Richard Taylor and myself, we decided to study the, uh, the structure of the proton using electrons, essentially using them as a very high powered microscope to see the inside of it. And we're using a certain process called inelastic scattering, which means that you hit the proton, you break it up into many pieces, many particles are emitted, you only observe the electron. And when this uh, proposal was made to the program committee, which has to approve of experiments at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, which was a linear accelerator, which was a 20 million electron volt uh, machine, which uh, was the most powerful electron accelerator in the world at the time. The program committee said this was an absolute waste of time. And 
we had to promise to do something else instead. But we would measure this process as a background for those measurements. Well, it turned out we, start, we started doing those measurements. And the background turned out to be more interesting than the measurements we were supposed to do. And it, it, they were so interesting that the program committee decided to change its mind, and we got an immense amount of time. And this was a program which led to the discovery of quarks inside the proton. So again, it demonstrated to me that if we were only going to listen to the experts and not take a risk, we would have never been able to discover this. So this is the second time in my life that, that it happened. And it, and it really, I, and I can really say that the two most important things I did in my physics career were, were projects that I was told in advance were an absolute waste of time. So that's a, that's a message I want you to take and think about. Because in a certain sense, there are always experts trying to tell you something won't work, isn't sensible. And you have to be careful because there are things that aren't sensible. For example, if somebody says to you, I know how to make a, make a perpetual motion machine, that I think you've got to be very careful about because the conservation of energy has been tested in so many different places, in so many different ways. However, in the case of parity, it had never been tested for that process. In the case of the electron scattering, it had never been studied in that process. So there's, these were two cases in which there was no real information, but an enormous amount of prejudice that was a waste of time. And that's what you have to take into mind when you think about things that you do in your life and in science and engineering. I think I've used up my time, and now it's time for questions. Thank you. And uh, Slack Laboratory with Kendall and Taylor, you were you were in the pursuit of, of something very unknown. Uh, people didn't believe in you. What crossed your mind at that time? Uh, you found, later, you found something in some ways bigger. Uh, it changed the way that we see things. What was your inspiration back in that time? Well, you know, it, it was the following. It, I have to admit to you that we were not searching for quarks. And quarks had been proposed, they had been rejected by the community, and they've been searched for all, you know, all through, all through all through nature, it accelerated, there were no quarks were found. And so we were not necessarily searching for quarks. We said to ourselves something different. Nobody really knows what's going on inside the proton. We should look. It has never been, it has never been tested. It has never been, it has never been uh, examined. And we should look. So it's like the following. Uh, if something has the potential to be interesting, and nobody has ever looked at it before, irrespective of what your initial prejudice is, you should look, you should look at it. You're curious, that's what, that's what science is all about. Science is curiosity. What is inside the proton? How does it, how does it work? And that, that's what motivates us. Thank you. Innovators of today's and tomorrow's globalized world. Well, it's, it, first of all, it's very hard to give advice. There's so much advice that one could give. I, I'm not sure I'm capable of giving all that good advice. But what I'm trying to, I would, I would say the following. Uh, first thing is keep an open mind. Uh, push, push to, to levels that you think not that you can't necessarily be assured to work. What I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that. In all walks of life, if you're trying to ever accomplish something, and you, if you stay too safe in what you're doing, yes, you'll, you'll actually develop this, or you'll develop that to make it a little better, but you won't find anything radically new and radically, uh, that will radically change whatever, whatever technology you're dealing with. 
So I would say keep an open mind and be willing to take some risks, because I think that's very important. I think that's the most important thing. I have read some articles about uh, some new models for for, for uh, particles. Uh, some some of, some of them talk about uh, shape certain shape for fundamental particles uh, like a toroid or donut. Uh, and some calcul some calculations. Uh, they show that the model, uh, like a physical model, it's it's better to explain interactions be between certain particles. Uh, I don't know if you have uh, have uh, read some about about this, or or if the quark model have uh, have uh, to to. The quarks have to be point-like particles, or they can be uh, a, a toroid. Well, I, I believe in evidence-based science, and you know, in a certain sense, great efforts have been made to try to understand both the size and the shape of the, of the quark, and they appear to be so small that even with the high energy, highest energy machines. All you can do is get an upper limit on their size and certainly no information about their shape. So, you know, people can speculate as much as they want, but the truth of the matter will only come out as a result of experiment. Now, most likely, uh, quarks are much smaller than we think they are. They, you know, they, we have an upper limit of 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Which basically is, you know, I think I gave the analogy in my lecture, but let me just repeat it in case people have forgotten. If I take a carbon atom and I blow it up to the size of the Earth, a quark would be smaller than a quarter of an inch in comparison. So that's how small a quark is, but that's the upper limit. And, uh, you know, according to the idea of the, of the fundamental particles, it's probably a good deal smaller. Now, uh, string theory also proposes a shape. They say it's a little string of some sort with vibrations. But of course, that string is 10 to the minus 32 centimeters. We will never be able to test that, that, that picture. That, that, that's 15 orders of magnitude higher energy would be required that exists at the LHC. So I think that, that kind of speculation can be fun but it's, it's really not very relevant to the science that we've done. Okay. Uh, so if this model uh, could calculate some properties from, for particles, uh, it's, it's mathematically good to research in this model? Well, it, I think you, 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 you can, you know, the point is, is that mathematics is, is fine, uh, but unless you have the capacity to test it, it's not very much relevant. Now let me point out something. On, on, the, on the other hand, the, it turns out that if you look at nuclei, they can be, they can have all kinds of strange shapes. You know, they can be ellipsoids and things like that. And people actually have measured those properties because the nucleus is quite large. You know, we're talking, we're talking about 10 to the minus 12 centimeters. And that's well within the range of actually measuring the shape and size. But that's the only level at which any kind of particular shape has any relevance whatsoever. And in fact, there's no relevance in terms of the shape in terms of the, uh, the theories. Because you see, in the theories, the theories basically see quarks and electrons as points. The shape, the shape, of, the, the, shape of the object has no relevance to the theory. And these theories have been tested, the standard model has been tested to enormous precision at Fermi Lab, at SLAC, at LEP, and now with the LAC, and it seems to be a beautiful theory. It seems to be conformed to what's measured. Thank you. Uh, United Science.
do you think that the science is really uh, united enough? I'm talking about, I can uh, speak about uh, physics and I can really link it with, the, for example, the psychology or something like that. Well, you mean uh, interdisciplinary work, you know, how to relate the sciences to one another? Yeah, work in uh, the different areas of the science uh, working together. Do you think that they're working together right now? Oh yes, it's starting to be uh, very prominent. I mean, uh, for example, I'm helping develop a new university in, uh, in Okinawa, which has just opened up. And it's a research, it's a graduate research university, and the whole idea is to develop a structure to encourage and nurture uh, interdisciplinary work. And we, we, have, we have physicists and mathematicians there, and life scientists and chemists, and the idea is for them to do whatever they want, but by bringing them together, we hope to, that they will work together on various, various problems, and for example, uh, to help develop such a structure, this university has no academic departments. It just has laboratories where people work on projects. No academic departments. You can get courses in physics, and mathematics, and chemistry, but there is no department. And it's working out very well. And you know, there are certain problems in science which will absolutely require interdisciplinary work. One of the one of the great mysteries in science today is how the brain works. And that, to get, to get an understanding of how the brain really works, will take engineers, physicists, chemists, mathematicians, and life scientists all working together. And that's what's going on in the various uh, institutes that study the brain. It's going on. And so there are, there are some problems which absolutely require interdisciplinary work, and it is happening, and it will happen more and more in the future. Okay, thank you. question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I guess what I, what I try to do is try to, you know, if I learn something, I try to under, understand it as a whole rather than looking at little parts of it. And I find, at least in my mind, that once I understand it as a whole, how it fits into other things, I can understand it much better and I really do understand it. If I try to take little pieces and understand it alone, very often I have, I have difficulty. So I guess my, my study technique is, try, is to try to read things over, read them over and over again, trying to go through the reasoning, and then trying to understand the, the, entire, the entire structure in, in which this knowledge fits in. And, and that, that I find very useful. But I'm not sure it's useful for everybody. I mean, I think different people have different modes of learning. And I think what you have to do is find the mode of learning that you are most comfortable with and, and which is most effective for you. And so I wouldn't want to prescribe that necessarily for everybody. Okay, thank you. some of your answers, you define yourself as an uh, experiment. Uh, can you describe the way of uh, experimental physicist and what is the uh, most important of that part of development of, of scientists and which is the principal difference with a theoretical physicist? Yes, okay, uh, you, know, in, in, you know, in a certain sense, uh, 
one has to be careful when one thinks about experimental physics. It's an experimental, a, a experimental physicist in general doesn't only do experiments. A good experimental physicist will think of what is relevant and why it's relevant and what is, what, what is possible. Uh, I, I, let me give you an example, uh, which happened to me, and then you'll see what I mean. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was Fermi's last student, and Enrico Fermi was an absolute genius. He could take any physical problem and, in very short order, write down one or two equations, rather simple equations, and come to an answer which was probably close to the correct answer. The man understood physics so deeply that he could do that. The answers were never exact. He could do exact calculus. He was also a fantastic theorist in his younger days. But in it, when, near the end of his career, he decided that uh, only great progress would be made in experimental physics at that point. More had to be understood before one could develop theories. And he was actually correct. And so he himself went from theory to experiment. And he spent all his time in experiment, although he did theoretical calculations on the side. So I observed this, and when we were starting our, our experiment looking at the prototype, uh, so I said, look, at that. we're preparing this experiment. I don't have much time to work on it. We're developing all this equipment and building things. I went to some theorists, and I asked the theorists to uh, make it a if, if we take the, what I call the, uh, the, the uh, current picture of the proton, if we scatter electrons from it, what will we expect to see? Because you have to have some template. You're going to go into some totally unknown area. You have to get some measure of what you're actually seeing. So I went to a, a couple of theorists, and they, they said, absolutely not. It's too messy. It's, 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 it could just be junk. And so I, I decided, I said to myself, what would Enrico Fermi do? And I went, I'm not as, anywhere as smart as Enrico Fermi, so don't worry, I'm not comparing myself to Enrico Fermi. But what, he would sit down and make an approximation about what to expect. And I sat down and I did exactly that. And when we started doing the measurements, uh, so, so we started getting results. So we had a template to compare. So initially, the results, was, you know, we were looking at the, the scatter results for a factor two greater than what I calculated. Yeah, it's a, an approximate thing. What's so bad? What's, you know, you don't get excited about that. We continue. We went up to change the, the kinematic to the higher, so-called higher momentum pressure. And the results turned out to be five times bigger. And then 10 times bigger. Then 100 times bigger. Then a thousand times bigger, and at that point, we knew we were onto some new physics. But if we didn't have that template, we would never know that. And so, if you're an experimental physicist, you have to know roughly what you expect to measure if you're going to do anything significantly. So, experimental physicists have to be what I call approximate theorists. If they really want to be do something. Now, a theorist would not make the measurement. He or she would sit down and calculate a process and try to get the exact number to be as accurate as possible. And that's the difference. And therefore, so an experiment, experimentalist may get, want to get an approximate number, but then he wants to get an exact measurement. And then ultimately that exact measurement is compared with the exact calculation. And that's, and that's how you make progress. But sometimes the calculations are too complicated and experiment has to lead. And that's what happened. Thank you very much. Uh, science is curiosity and I believe you're a very, very curious man because you chose your career based on a doubt instead of a certainty. You said you had a question that you wanted to solve. So you left arts on the side and you decided to go through physics which is uh, something everyone would do. So when you were in high school, you read a book with lots of equations. 
and you didn't back down, you didn't back, um, you went up to it, you took the challenge. I think that's why you're very, very curious. Uh, sadly, nowadays, uh, generations aren't as curious as they used to be, or I think our students, they don't make enough questions about the things we teach them. So how is it possible to feed curiosity? Because if it's the, the, the root of science or the main uh, ingredient, how is it possible to motivate them, to make them more curious about things, about the world? About, I think it's uh, something we need in every domain to be curious, but how do you feed it? How do you maintain it? How do you keep it alive? Okay, that's a very good question. How do we, how do we uh, create curiosity and maintain curiosity among young people? Is that fundamentally what the question is? Yeah, and through life, but yeah. young people. Well, if you, if you start young people at an early age, Excited with curiosity, and the school system doesn't squelch it, then that person will end up being curious for the rest of his or her life. Part of the problem is, is that, you know, young, you know it's always said, and it's true, that children are, are, are original scientists. Because what do the scientists want to do? The scientist, the scientist wants to know how the world works. When a child comes into uh, in, in, into connection with the environment and the world around him or her. That's exactly what the child is trying to understand. And the child wants to know why this, why that. And you know, there, and so at, at some stage in school, uh, people are said, well, that's not important. You know, you'll learn that later. Uh, sometimes it comes from, from, uh, from teachers not really knowing the answer. Or teachers having a different point of view about how one should teach. I mean, for example, we have all these devices in life. You know, we have cell phones, we have, we have tablets, we have computers. And has anybody really sat, you know, how many kids have sat down and said, Gee, how does this work? I have this phone, I can talk to somebody thousands of miles away. There's not even a wire connected to it. How does it work? Now, what happens if a student, let's say in the second or third grade, goes and asks the teacher about how it works? Well, unless there's a, an attempt to really answer it in a way in which a child could comprehend it and excite the child's curiosity, uh, that child may be squelched. It may, it may stop asking questions. And we can't do that. So we have to, in the, in the school system, we have to have what I call inquiry-based education as well as other types of education. What I mean by inquiry-based education, we have to ask, you know, try to try to uh, get students to think about how things work around them. And they can understand it in, in, in terms of very simplified concepts. I'll tell you a, a, a little example I had. It was really interesting, and then I'll, I'll stop. Once I was visiting a laboratory, uh, and they said I was going to go visiting visit school, they wanted me to come and visit school, so they took me to fifth grade. And uh, then I, I went in and I said, hello to the students there, I thought it'd be fine. Now you have this class for 25 minutes. She had never told me I had a class for 25 minutes. What am I going to do with a class of fifth graders or so in 25 minutes? I hadn't prepared anything. So I was standing there, I looked up at the ceiling, I saw this light, <laughs> and sort of a light turned on over my head, and I said, oh, we're going to have a little, a little question today. How does that light work? Why does it give us light? And I want you to think about it for five minutes, and then I want each of you to tell the others what your theory is. So that way I was able to use up 25 minutes quite rapidly, but the point is, these kids were so excited about thinking about it and, and trying to develop an idea of how it worked that they really were excited and they, they, I held their interest. And then after we went through all the various possibilities, I gave them a little lecture uh, on how the light bulb worked and they were very excited. And, it, and, and to me it showed that even little questions like that can have an enormous impact on kids. We have to do more of that. And we, we, we have to get away from having kids memorize formulas. That's the way to kill science. We should have to memorize concepts and ideas. 
Later, they can memorize formulas once they're hooked. But don't have them memorize formulas too early. So that's my short, but the long answer to a short question. Thank you very much.
all for your wonderful questions. They were really wonderful questions to answer. Thank you so much. One quick note. The Honeywell career panel is going on until 3.45 at Aula Magna. Engineer faculty, please stop by. They will be holding a drawing at the end for a 2x Doom tablet.